And thank you all for joining us tonight at the Graves Lecture Series. Uh, before I introduce our speaker, I would like to personally thank Dr. David Nesham. He was very significant in bringing Dr. Bakavoy, is yes, that how it is, yeah. to campus and also <coughs> assisting me in the scheduling and the time and the date. So thank you, Dave. You anyway, our featured speaker is Dr. Matt Bakavoy. He is a senior editor at the University of Nebraska Press, and it's quite an honor to have him on campus. He's also widely published. Recently, the University of Nebraska Press, in partnership with other um, entities, re was rewarded a $2.5 million grant, correct, mm -hmm. to um, put together 17 series of the Franz Boas papers. So not surprisingly, the title of his talk is The Franz Boas Papers, Documentary Innovation and Culture Cultural Repatriation. Correct. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Matt Bogaboy. Okay, well, yeah, uh, yeah, I'm really grateful to be here today, and I want to thank uh, Dave Neshine for recommending me for the Graves Lecture, and I'm glad that everybody could come tonight. And uh, I'm going to talk about um, an institutional partnership that I uh, conceptualized and, um, um, you know, uh, followed through to completion. It's a documentary edition of the Franz Boas Papers. Uh, Franz Boas is often known as the, uh, you know, one of the few, one of the few, maybe three founders of professional anthropology uh, in the United States. That is to uh, professionalize it as an academic discipline and to have it institutionalized in the American university system, from private universities uh, to uh, the public system. Um, and uh, this uh, partnership is between the University of Nebraska Press, um, the American Philosophical Society in Philadelphia, which is the nation's oldest learned society, and also a major repository for the papers of humanists and social scientists uh, with a special emphasis in a very large collection of uh, social scientist papers from the discipline of anthropology. Uh, and also University of Western Ontario, uh, which is the uh, home institution uh, of the general editor of the Franz Boas papers, uh, is a, a fairly well-renowned um, anthropologist named Regna Darnell, uh, who uh, has kind of uh, secondary connections to the first generation of uh, Bozian uh, trained anthropologists. And uh, you know this uh, institutional partnership began uh, in 2008 when I started at the University of Nebraska Press. Um, you know I was taking over the position as a Native American and Indigenous Studies editor and also the Western History editor. And, uh, I do some also trade acquisitions in uh, non-academic books uh, about the American West in, in narrative nonfiction. And uh, <coughs> I was taking over one of the premier you know, uh, Native and Indigenous Studies lists in uh, scholarly publishing. And one of the series that we uh, sponsor at the press is uh, the Critical Studies in the History of Anthropology series. And Regna Darnell and her colleague Stephen Murray were the series editors. And uh, before coming to the press, uh, I had an academic career and had written a book and had run out a lot of publications about uh, you know, the cultural history of the American Southwest, and uh, that necessarily meant dealing with uh, the public presentation of anthropological research uh, throughout the region from New Mexico to Southern California. Um, and uh, I had to work in the uh, Franz Boas papers uh, at uh, an early point in the project to understand the, uh, uh, the type of um, uh, southwestern research that was uh, going on um, in the early 20th century for a couple chapters of my book. And so I had familiarized myself and read through the collection, uh, not only on my immediate and specific subject at hand, which was a history of two world's fairs in San Diego and its connection to the American Southwest and the Americas, but um, you know, I started looking around. The papers are about 120 Point five linear feet of documents um, 
and it's split between three it's split between three uh, main themes, which are his professional papers, which are drafts of articles and books and um, uh, his uh, field journals from his extensive field work over his career, to his correspondence. To uh, there's about also 30, 30 linear feet of um, linguistic material uh, 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 about the North American Indian languages. Um, and so when I was doing my specific research, I um, I was uh, you know looking at the finding aid and looking particularly through the correspondence, and I saw correspondence from people like Albert Einstein, and, and Boaz had an extensive correspondence. Zora Neale Hurston, the Harlem Renaissance writer, was one of his students and took an MA with him at Columbia University in the 1920s, among other you know, uh, intellectual you know, dignitaries you know, of his particular time period. Uh, he lived in the United States, which was 1887, to his death in 1942. And so I knew that the collection was really significant. Um, um, I'd read all, you know, all the published work on Franz Boas while I was working on my book, and some of it, um, you know, um, some of it is very good, and most of it is um, uh, has a problem of situating him and his uh, social science. Uh, you know, research uh, in a historicist fashion. So there was a lot of really bad and shoddy scholarship uh, circulating out in the academy uh, about Franz Boas, uh, particularly when you, you know, are familiar with the collection and with his papers. And so I knew this was a significant collection, and I thought it would be really interesting because, you know, his, uh, you know, concepts and uh, the methodologies that he spelled out in his discipline spilled very widely throughout the humanities, social sciences, sciences, and arts, that it would be, you know, maybe a good idea to talk to Regna Darnell about doing a documentary, uh, you know, series uh, of his, uh, in, of his entire collection. And so, uh, you know, she thought that that was a good idea, and one thing led to another. She's a, she, she is a fellow of the American Philosophical Society, and so, she invited me to the spring meeting one year in April, and we met with um, the librarian there, um, Martin Levitt, uh, who is a, by training a public historian, but also has skills in archival management. And we met with uh, Baruch Bloomberg, who was the president of uh, American Philosophical Society. Uh, for those of you who are in the science, you might know him as the biochemist who developed the uh, the hepatitis uh, A and B vaccine. Uh, he's one of the uh, premier biochemists of his generation. And so we started to talk about the institutional collaboration. Um, and, uh, you know, we held some, you know, we got some seed money from the Social Science Research Council of Canada to have a symposium of uh, kind of significant, um, you know, uh, um, uh, researchers in the, er in, the, in the areas where Boaz had conducted his field work, and so we assembled them in London, Ontario, at the University of Western Ontario, uh, to see, you know, what, to try to conceptualize what the documentary series would look like. Um, and so we just kind of continued to, you know, work on it until um, we were invited to apply for you know, a final grant with SSHRC, which we obtained in March of this past year, you know, for $2.5 million to fund about 20 uh, junior, and, uh, junior and senior scholars and also graduate students to run out thematically the volumes of the papers. But we have a projected 17 volumes, uh, but we're going to do enough work to do 25 uh, volumes. Uh, when the project is completed, so we're going to use that money wisely to run out about another eight volumes uh, thereafter. <coughs> and I'll talk a little bit about the details and the particulars of the uh, collaboration, uh, but uh, I'd like to kind of talk about who is Franz Boas. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, he was a German-born, um, uh, actual 
actually scientist. He received his PhD in physics. Uh, you know, there was no uh, graduate degree in the discipline of anthropology at the time that he went through the German university. Uh, most of the um, most of the uh, researchers, if you want to call them that, were natural historians uh, in the uh, you know uh, throughout most of the 19th century until the emergence of the modern university and establishment of the what we call the legitimate academic disciplines in the humanities and social sciences. And um, <clears throat> uh, but uh, he was very interested in uh, the study of other uh, human cultures. Uh, he, he began his fieldwork experience in, uh, 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 in Baffin Island in uh, 1883 and 1885 uh, among what was known then as the Eskimos. Today they call themselves the Inuits. And then uh, later in that uh, decade in the 1880s at Vancouver Island uh, among who, people he called the Kwakutl Indians, uh, today they call themselves the uh, Kwakwakawaks, and they speak the Kwakwala language. Uh, and beginning with this, you know, uh, you know, kind of early period of field research, um, you know, uh, uh, that uh, Boaz, um, you know, started to try to understand the kind of, uh, you know, uh, internally coherent structure of non-Western and non-Christian societies. Um, and uh, this was during a time uh, when the work of Charles Darwin was starting to be popularized and, um, um, and uh, you know, a number of uh, you know, uh, social scientists were starting to create social theories around the inherent inferiority uh, and superiority of uh, you know, uh, technologically unsophisticated and technologically sophisticated societies. Probably the person most associated with this is uh, the uh, pro, you know, proto-anthropologist, natural historian, Lewis Henry Morgan in his book, Ancient Society, which theorized that all societies uh, you know, evolved from a state of primitivism through barbarism to you know, civilized. And uh, it was that, what was called the comparative method, which was the edifice of human science that Boaz began and throughout his entire career sought to chip away and ultimately destroy uh, through uh, many of his groundbreaking books. Um, so, it, so in some ways, Boaz, you know, it, uh, was a pioneer in breaking down American isolationism uh, and its incumbent intolerance and misinformation about cultural, linguistic, and biological diversity. Uh, Boaz did research in the what we what are now the four fields of anthropology, and biological anthropology, cultural anthropology, uh, archaeology and material culture, and, um, and also linguistics. Um, you know, uh, throughout his career, uh, that he um, you know, emerged also as a significant public intellectual. Uh, his, one of the main organs that he published uh, the popularization of what you would call liberal science or progressive science. We can think of them as a part of the progressive movement. Uh, was through the Nation magazine. Um, and uh, he was, throughout his entire lifetime, he was a defender of intellectual and cultural freedom. Probably uh, the uh, most notorious incident that he was known for um, was uh, in 1919 in the Nation magazine he wrote uh, a uh, uh, you know an editorial piece called uh, Scientists as Spies and this is in the aftermath of World War One uh, and that many people in the social science community and those doing field work in places like um, you know Mexico Central America and also South America were working for the uh, office of uh, um, the, uh, the uh, Office of um, Strategic Information uh, and Scientists as Spies was aimed uh, uh, directly at, without naming him, <coughs> the Southwestern and uh, Central American archaeologist Sylvanus Morley, uh, who was uh, being paid uh, by the, uh, 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 the Department of War at that time and having his re field research 
underwritten um, through uh, his you know, ability to gather intelligence in Central America. The U.S. government was worried about uh, you know, Germany's influence um, in the uh, Western Hemisphere. Um, in the early 1930s, um, well, from the late 1920s through the early 1930s, that he was um, <coughs> one of the few <coughs> social scientists in the United States to sign petitions and to denounce the rise of Nazi racial science and the legacy of the uh, kind of you know racialist uh, German physical anthropologist Felix von Luschan and that particular legacy in German anthropology. Uh, during the decade, he was an organizer <coughs> and a kind of uh, main activist within the American Committee for the Protection of the Foreign Born. That is, uh, to, uh, you know, it was an advocacy organization uh, to support the, right, the rights of uh, ethnic Americans and new immigrants. Um, you know, uh, he was always, you know, uh, throughout his entire career, really skeptical of the popularization of Darwinian ideas known as the eugenics movement, which uh, emerged in the <coughs> early years of the 20th century as a sort of pseudoscience that was mostly uh, kind of controlled and led by what you would call uh, the last lingering batch of natural historians or what you call gentlemen scientists. These are often wealthy and fairly well educated, but uh, somewhat misguided from the standpoint of scientific methodology. Um, uh, you know, kind of dabblers in you know the world of uh, you know academic research and American intellectualism. The two uh, you know largest members in that society were Charles Davenport, uh, who had a laboratory at Cold Springs Harbor, New York, and was a leader of the eugenics, uh, a leader and promoter of the eugenics movement, and also the popular writer Lothrop Stoddard, uh, whose book I'm trying to remember the exact title. Uh, the rising tide of color against uh, uh, worldwide. Uh, uh, sorry, is the rising tide of color? It's a very long. The rising tide of color against. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, but uh, it, it it was his uh, very popular book on eugenics, um, published in the early 1920s. Um, in my own research, uh, when I was, um, you know, when I was looking through the Boas papers, I had to look through them to understand a scientist that was involved in putting together the anthropology exhibit at the 1915 World's Fair in San Diego. He was a, a, a Czech Bohemian immigrant um, who, uh, you know, um, had obtained, uh, you know, his um, his. Um, uh, his degree at the School of Anthropology in Paris um, in the uh, 1880s and 1890s. His name was Alish Herlishka, and he was the chief physical anthropologist at the United States National Museum, and he was involved in putting together uh, the anthropology exhibition, which was uh, kind of a racialist exhibition uh, about like uh, the origins of humanity and about um, you know, the various so-called races of the world, which were separated actually by nationalities. Um, and, uh, um, and so to kind of understand uh, Alex Hrlishka's science, I had to read through his correspondence with Franz Boas and uh, a lot of other scholars who had worked on the fair and worked on Alex Hrlishka had thought that he was uh, you know, a supporter of the eugenics movement and that he was that he fit into the German physical anthropological tradition after Felix von Luschan. Uh, that's where scientific racism and scientific racialism, uh, uh, you know, was uh, you know kind of institutionalized uh, in the transatlantic academy. And so what I found going through the correspondence was that, at, and then you know, reading the correspondence and reading Herlushka's work and learning about the science of that period was that he actually wasn't, that he and, he, he and Boaz had had a long-standing relationship going to the early 1890s when they were both fledgling 
anthropologists and that they had corresponded frequently about things like race mixture and whether, um, you know, things like intelligence um, and uh, other kinds of cultural national traits, you know, were inherited through the blood or not. And uh, what I found was that uh, Herlishka was actually uh, very subservient to the type of pioneering social science research on, uh, you know, biological theories of race and cultural relativism that Boas had pioneered. And uh, so I was able to read that exhibition and in some ways to kind of revise and to reread Alice Her Herlishka within the anthropological tradition. Uh, the historians who've written about it when they reviewed my book, they, they trashed that part of the book. All the anthropologists who are now my colleagues that I work with say that those chapters are like the best you know, revisionist interpretation based on evidence um, you know, and the documentary record uh, about Alice Herlishka. And so you know, I've always had a strange relationship with my own discipline of history in that way because you need to read through the papers. And also, if you're going to work on the history of science, you need to master the science as well, even though you don't have training in it. So I was always asking anthropo uh, anthropologist colleagues lots of questions and asking for reading lists. So I was just able to write you know, a chapter and a half in my book. <laughs> now the legacy of Boaz's field work um, is both related to his methodology uh, and also the kinds of ethics that he uh, um, began and initiated uh, in, you know, the way that researchers collaborate with particularly, uh, uh, you know, um, Native American, First Nation, and Indigenous communities. <coughs> you know, he was also, you know, uh, his legacy uh, in, um, you know, um, in theories about biological diversity uh, and <coughs> his critique of racial science are long-standing, um, and um, he also had a number of publications that even delved into things like indigenous philosophy uh, and its relationship to social structure. I'm thinking of his 1927 book, Primitive Art. Uh, but some of the other really you know, uh, you know, groundbreaking works he wrote were the uh, Social Organization and Secret Societies of the Kwakutl Indians, uh, which was published in 1897. Uh, the Mind of Primitive Man, which is his definitive statement uh, about the importance of um, cosmology to the social structure of societies. And there is a, you know, non-Western or like indigenous, um, um, you know, there's, there's a suggestion that there, you know, are non-Western philosophies that govern uh, particular societies. Uh, also, the Handbook of North American Indian Languages. <coughs> um, he did some pioneering research for the U.S. Immigration Commission on immigrant. It, it was an immigrant head form study, where he argued that um, you know that uh, uh, for the biological plasticity of of race um, that uh, previously among physical anthropologists. It, the science of craniology, you know, uh, made direct connections between phenotype and intelligence, or phenotype, and um, the level of um, cultural sophistication, or cultural primitiveness, or cultural bar barbarism. The work he did uh, in the head form study uh, demolished that and noted that, uh, you know, there's no, you know, there's no connection between phenotype and, you know, like uh, racial traits. <coughs> um, later in his career, he wrote uh, Anthropology and Modern Life, uh, and uh, his last work he published two years before his death was uh, Race, Language, and Culture, which was a collection of some of his, <coughs> uh, a revised collection of some of his, um, you know, pioneering articles across the four fields of anthropology. <coughs> um, in terms of his um, role, in the <coughs> institutionalization of professional anthropology departments in the United States, his, the, the students that he trained at Columbia University um, are, were uh, the leading generation of anthropologists, uh, um, uh, you know, um, uh, 
you know, after his, uh, this, he, he had students such as Alfred Krover, who founded the anthropology department at UC Berkeley, and was very instrumental in training anthropologists to do like the uh, Pacific Coast and Pacific Slope in California, uh, you know, uh, anthropological research. Uh, and, uh, you know, another one of the students was Ruth Benedict and Margaret Mead, who were, uh, you know, uh, two very important public intellectuals who uh, developed what was known as the Culture and Personality School. They're early progenitors of that uh, approach and methodology to studying cultures who were also well-known authors. That is, they worked with commercial trade publishers, most of which were located in New York and Philadelphia in the 1920s and 30s and 40s. Uh, Paul Radin uh, was also um, you know, one of his um, students, Edward Sapir, a linguist, Ashley Montague, who uh, you would consider uh, a second generation of, uh, of Bozian trained anthropologist who was a physical anthropologist in the post World War II period. Uh, Zora Neale Hurston, uh, the writer, uh, was his MA student. Robert Lowy, Clark Whistler, John Swanton. Elsie Clues Parsons, uh, who was, uh, wrote some pioneering work uh, on uh, the Pueblo Indians of New Mexico. Also Melville, Melville Hershkovitz, whose uh, main field of research was uh, um, you know, uh, African-American culture history and folklore. Uh, Manuel Gamio, whose main field of research was um, studying um, ethnic Mexican culture history and folklore. And uh, one of his last students is the uh, anthropologist uh, Frederica de Laguna, uh, who is still alive today. And um, you know, the, I think overall the relevance of his field work um, um, in terms of uh, researchers collaborating with communities uh, and, and um, trying to have uh, you know, respondents and other uh, <coughs> Sorry, and other informants, uh, you know, was to listen to them seriously describe the structure of their society and to integrate those types of uh, characterization, you know, self-characterizations of one's own culture into uh, academic research uh, begins with him. And um, <coughs> I'm going to move on from there and to kind of describe the project a little bit. <coughs> and so in the institutional collaboration, um, one of the things that um, we're trying to do, um, and this really emerged when we, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> when we had, <coughs> when we had meetings with um, the editor of the Thomas Jefferson papers and the editors of the Benjamin Franklin papers, it was a uh, Barbara Oberg and uh, Richard and Susan Dunn. <coughs> they, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> they said to us, um, "What, you know, how fast do you want to do the documentary edition?" You know, uh, we said, "Well, you know, we can only apply for an SSHRC grant, you know, uh, for seven years. You know, that is, uh, you know, the the term of the award." And they said, well, you know, you're going to have to think about a way to, to have multiple documentary teams working at the same time or simultaneously to run out, you know, a one, two, or three volumes apiece. And uh, Barbara said, um, you know, I'm like the seventh editor of the Thomas Jefferson papers, whose papers is in the APS as well. Um, that project began in 1950. And she said, well, we're on like, vol I th like I think they're on like volume 35 or volume 33. And that she said, um, there's going to be probably 50 volumes and I'll be retired and I will probably be dead by the time it's concluded. I think it's 2025 is when they're trying to finish it up. And then <coughs> the Dunn said, yeah, you know, I think we were the, you know, sixth, fifth or sixth set of editors for the Benjamin Franklin papers and that began in 1948. <clears throat> and so, you know, these large documentary series have been going on for, you know, 50 or 60 years. And so, um, 
we were having the meeting with Martin Levitt and Regna and I, and then um, <coughs> Martin said, well, one of the things that's happening in the archival world and the collections management world is that, um, you know, uh, uh, that a lot of heavily used collections um, are being scanned. And, uh, you know, the holding repositories are investing themselves through donors or grant programs to digitize their collections for use internally, um, you know, in their, in their institution. And so that, you know, a collection would be scanned in its entirety with rich metadata added to each document, and then um, it would be hosted on their server. And so when people would come into the library, that they, you know, they have computer consoles and that you log in and that you can access the collection in its digital version, and you can use keywords to search for things. And it'll provide lists and inventories of whatever the keyword is that you put in. Um, and everyone said, hmm, that's really interesting, you know. And so we, we kept talking about it and pursuing it, and um, <coughs> this is how this project is going to be done. Um, the APS made a really substantial investment to have the entire Franz Boas collection digitized. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's, it could be a million point five two million individual documents. Um, and uh, that is a collection that they uh, pull out for researchers on a regular basis. It's the most heavily utilized collection at APS because of Boaz's social network that a lot of people use it to get to other people. In terms of correspondence and other things like that, people work on linguistics, use the linguistics side, people who work on individual subjects that were within Boaz's you know, research frame, you know, use the professional papers. But a lot of people who use the correspondence because they can get at other, you know, to pick up conversations, uh, you know, about uh, the issues of the day. And so um, they have problems where, like, you know, someone will tear a, a document and then they say to the archivist, well, I tore the document. They take the document and fill out the paperwork, and it goes to a paper conservator. And then they have to pay money to have it repaired, and then it, you know, it's not in the collection, and then it eventually comes back, and they put it in there. And so for them, <coughs> so, for, so, so, so APS, you know, beyond the concept of the project, it, it, it solved very practical problems of collection management for them. <coughs> and they were more than happy to make the you know, initial investment to have the entire collection scanned. And so, and, and so on our side, in terms of the rapidity of the work to be done, is that we've resolved the problem of uh, having people apply for sabbaticals or to ask for course buyouts, the cost of travel, the cost of lodging, the cost of you know, incidental expenses, having to travel to Philadelphia to use the collection. So ideally, this will be the first documentary editing project uh, that has been done remotely via having the collection on a server. And what that should do, we hope, with the 20 or so you know, researchers that we're going to be funding, is that they'll be able to work on it and not have to travel to Philadelphia and, you know, and to make it a priority you know, so that we can get the work done. And uh, so that we're kind of taking the cost out of the problems that, you know, the Jefferson Papers and the Franklin Papers have had over the years to get specialists to come in and to work to help the general editor work on a particular volume because of their academic expertise. Um, and, uh, and then uh, f from, from that point forward, people can just come to APS and they can use the collection or there might be eventually a way that they're going to allow people to log in remotely, but it will not be in the public domain and it will not be open access because of the nature of the collection. Um, and, um, you know, I guess I'll just say a couple more things um, about the collaboration. Um, is that um, we've had some sub-conferences, particularly with um, young and new generation quack waka walk knowledge keepers uh, and uh, I call them kind of organic intellectuals. Uh, they're, 
the younger generation of uh, well-educated Waka Waka men and women who are going to university and getting advanced degrees at the MA or PhD level um, uh, in anthropology and other disciplines. Uh, uh, the Canadian basis of the grant and the original Canadian basis of Boaz's research is that um, you know, the things that he collected are of immense interest and value to First Nations communities, uh, particularly the Inuits and also uh, the Kwakwakawaks, among others. And so um, we have uh, uh, the um, advisory, uh, sorry, the tribal council, uh, uh, the Kwakwakawak band from Alert Bay, um, you know, has um, kind of signed on to the project and um, about five or six of their young, you know, uh, uh, you know, knowledge keepers and intellectuals are on our advisory board and they're also going to be editing certain materials that belong to them in the uh, Franz Boas papers and they're going to be the editors of the volumes. So one of the things that we're kind of hoping from the standpoint of, fault, of epistemology is that the volumes will have a structure and presentation of those materials in the way that the communities understand the patterns of their culture. And so I'm really excited about that some of the volumes will have a, almost a non-Western, you know, non non-Enlightenment uh, kind of structure to them. And one of the really interesting conversations that we had, and there's a lot of tension uh, involved in it as well, but. Uh, uh, we had a special symposium on the, um, uh, on the social organization uh, and secret societies of Quaquitos publication. And a lot of the young knowledge keepers like, like, we use that book and it's really interesting, but like the way it's presented just doesn't make any sense to us. And it was really interesting to have this conversation with them about it. They said, if we were to present this material, we would do it another way and we would pri prioritize the significance to some things that Boaz thought was incidental. Mm -hmm. So that the anthropologist can't always, even with respondents, kind of replicate or to, you know, repackage or, or, or to present, you know, the, the, the structure of a society fundamentally different from theirs. And so we had this really interesting conversation and there's some people that were there who had been working in that research field as anthropologists for like 25 or 30 years, and they were having a really, really hard time <laughs> in accepting that, you know, these MA or PhD students who have read through the, the papers at APS, they've read through all the papers at, you know, National Anthropology Archive and every other holding institution. They've, they've probably done more research in the archives than a lot of the anthropologists who worked in this field. They're having a really hard time accepting that, you know. <laughs> And so that was like where all the tension was, and 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 so we got, so we got into this you know discussion about that, and and, and it was making me like really anxious, you know, because, <laughs> because I because I because I thought, why can't they wrap their head around that? That it just might be different, you know, that 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 they have a fundamental understanding of their own culture that's both learned from socialization and participating in the perpetuation of ritual life and religion, uh, and also academic training on top of that, uh, that it could be different. And so I think the, m m I think the metaphor that I, that I uh, used just to, because I was just getting annoyed that it was going around so much, I said, you know, it's a little bit like punk rock, like, uh, you know, the Quincy episode where, you know, um, there's a punk rock episode and all the punk rockers are violent. And it's like, well, not all punk rockers were violent. There were like peace punks and there were all these different sides of it. And so, and they said, exactly. <laughs> you know, because, because, because Marianne Nicholson, who's about my age, you know, and it's like an art, you know, she's an artist and also has an MA in literature. She said, I've seen that episode and that's exactly the perfect metaphor <laughs> about the problem we're having here at the table was that just cultural misrecognition was really what was going on. And so uh, I had to throw some humor into the conversation because it was getting really 
intense. Um, and, and, and so with their participation, you know, I think that you know, the, the impact in, the, uh, in social science methodology and theory that the documentary volumes will have uh, will also be supplemented by the fact that a number of the volumes will basically have a, a non-Western epistemological structure to them. And, and that, to me, is really exciting because I also have a, a PhD field in social theory and philosophy, and so you know, I'm really excited about that. Um, and so um, you know, we're just getting started you know, with managing the workflow, and we kind of don't know what that's going to look like yet, but, um, but uh, you know, we're basically in the first four or five months of the project, and it's really exciting to be able to come here and to talk with everybody about it. And uh, I guess I'll... Uh, s stop there, and I'll open up uh, you know, the discussion to uh, questions that you might have. So, uh, so how did you? What, what's the? What's the? Do the the indigenous people walk uh, get yeah, first access to everything that comes up on the search, and then the then the anthropologists are given a second fiddle to this, or how did you resolve the accessing uh, of the actual? They're actually going to uh, be doing annotations. Um, because by the time that the farthest along Kwak Wak uh, uh, culture bears um, get involved in the project and editing those volumes, they'll already have their degrees. And so they'll, they'll have the academic skills to present a, you know, to, to devise a structure of presentation to them. But then they've lost the whole point with the PhD and the academic Western views. Kind of. So, so you know, let them run without that. Well, kind of, but you know, but they'll be doing standard things like running annotations, uh, skill so, sets. Yeah, you know, so that's somewhere in between, you know, what they learned in their academic training and, and what they learned, you know, uh, growing up in the culture. Somewhere triangulated in between that, we're going to have something new, you know, so that it's not exclusive of the insights of, you know. Um, you know, doctoral knowledge in a particular field, but they're going to kind of be wedded together, and so we're going to have something triangulated in the middle of, you know, like a, you know, um, what, you know, Western knowledge, and scholastic knowledge, you know, and their community knowledge and their tribal knowledge, and whatever that is is going to be somewhere in between there. You know, the true, you know, a closer truth or a new understanding of it is going to emerge in that nexus. Yeah, that's a very good question. Absolutely. Oh, um, sure. Uh, you were saying four or five months into this project. How long do you suppose <laughs> it will take to finish it, more or less? Well, I think we're going to try to um, have work on 17 volumes ready by the, by the end of the seventh year of the grant. Um, and uh, that is volumes ready. <coughs> you know, I think we will have some volumes already published, <coughs> but at the end of the seven years is to have 17 either out or prepared and ready to transmit to the to the University of Nebraska Press for, mm -hmm. book, for book production. Uh, within that seven years, they want to do enough work to prepare an additional eight volumes. So, oh, yes, you mentioned that. Yeah, so we'll have about, uh, you know, I think, uh, the work done for the 17 volumes, and then uh, to have the groundwork done for another eight volumes yeah. to come out yeah. thereafter. And I think those will probably be, <coughs> depending on who's working on them and where people are at that time, they will come out via University of Nebraska Press, but they, but, but the, you know, the general editorship structure of the papers project will probably be dissolved by that time. So it'll be individual teams of editors that will be finishing up that work, mm -hmm. who had worked on, you know, uh, previous volumes. Thank you. Sure. Oh, Matt, um, as historians write it, um, some anthropologists, such as Margaret Mead, who yeah. uh, was trained by Boaz, yeah. wrote. Native American histories and ethnographies as mm -hmm. with the intention that they're capturing a dying culture before mm -hmm. it fades away. Did they learn that from Boaz or, or is that even not how anthropologists viewed what they were doing? Um, 
depends. I mean, you know, um, you know, I mean, it depends uh, the institutional location of where people were, were training graduate students and those graduate students that came out of those programs. Um, definitely before 1940, their uh, salvage, you know, anthropology, salvage ethnography is always in the background to a certain extent. Uh, you know, whether, uh, you know, the motivations for it are super complex, you know. Um, you know, I think uh, there was a, uh, there was a sense, you know, that the, you know, pace of, uh, you know, industrialization um, and the marginalization of uh, tribal communities uh, and reservation communities uh, would, um, you know, would 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 see the population statistics of Native peoples decline. You know, so you know, um, you know, I think that they're uh, on the more kind of conservative side of the anthropological uh, tradition. That um, you know, there was a sense that you know, uh, Native peoples would eventually vanish. You know. So, um, I mean, by 1890, you know, the population nadir of, you know, Native people in the United States, I think it was something close to like, you know, 887,000 or 900,000 Native people, you know, coming out of the 1890 census. Um, but, uh, I don't know, I mean, that's hard to tell. I mean, when you look at the linguistic materials and the way the Kwak Waka Waks um, describe the significance of those materials to them uh, is that when he was doing, when, when Boaz was transcribing, you know, stories and songs and other, uh, you know, oral, you know, oral traditions from, from the Kwak Waka Waks, he did them in phonetic transcriptions. Um, and Ryan and Marianne Nicholson have said to me that, you know, the phonetic transcriptions uh, are really important to us because there are layers of meanings of words in our language that no one remembers, but they, they're in the language materials. Uh, there are songs that have been forgotten, and we can, re and we can reconstruct them because they're all phonetic. There's no Indo-European, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, in, you know, there's no Indo-European language imposition in Boaz's transcriptions of the language. They're, they are exactly phonetic. And, you know, Ryan and Mary Ann and some of the other, um, you know, culture bearers uh, in their community can, can read them and transcribe them into their language. So, um, I mean, you could, you know, is it, you know, was Boaz motivated by salvage ethnography? I mean, I think, you know, he was just someone doing research. Um, and uh, I think he always knew that the materials would be useful later. But I don't feel Boaz himself thought that, uh, you know, that, um, you know, tribal peoples, you know, would disappear. But, you know, certainly uh, there are those, uh, you know, uh, but for um, those anthropologists who made it into the commercial publishing realm, like Mead and Ruth Benedict, uh, you could say that they perpetuated those types of tropes and stereotypes. You know, and I think they were probably motivated, you know, by their editors and their publishers, mm -hmm. you know, to write in that way, even though they knew that to be fundamentally untrue. That's how you make money as a public intellectual coming out of the university system, you know. And we, we have lots of uh, our esteemed colleagues, you know, across the disciplines who work with commercial publishers, you know, write things that are sensational. And it's because that level of publishing, uh, those are commercial vehicles. The book project is a commercial vehicle. That is, it's meant to fit into an investment structure within a corporation that is wanting to get 20 to 30% net profit out of everything they publish. So, you know, I think a lot of the, you know, um, during this time period when a lot of scholars who, you know, wrote on indigenous peoples um, 
worked with commercial publishers, they had a lot of pressure, you know, from their publishers to perpetuate those things because that's what people wanted to read. Um, in the academic discourse about them, I'm thinking of Michaela D. Leonardo's book, Exotics at Home, where she covers this material, you know, in fine detail, particularly among women anthropologists like Mead and Benedict. Um, it doesn't occur to her uh, that, you know, there's a critique of those tropes, the you know, vanishing Indian or that, you know, indigenous peoples are gonna vanish and salvage ethnography. But I don't think D. Leonardo uh, it crossed her mind that, you know, those those big books published by those anthropologists were commercial vehicles. They're they're an investment vehicle. Mm -hmm. And you can only know that by being on the publishing side. Um, and uh, you know, I see lots of them and I won't say any names, you know across at least the historical profession, that some of them have this, you know, esteemed endowed chairs you know, at some of the most prestigious universities. But I wonder if some of their books would make it through peer review. And that's just my you know, own opinion, you know, educated guess. But you know, to each their own. You know, we live in a free and open society, and people can pursue those kinds of opportunities. So, you know, but, uh, but yeah, you know, um, I think particularly the natural, you know, I, mean, I mean, this is a really good question because I hadn't thought about it, these things, but, um, you know, in the, you know, uh, natural historian time period, um, that, yeah, you know, I, you know, I mean, I did think that the kind of what you would call amateur scholars or whatever did believe that, you know, mm -hmm. Lewis Henry Morgan's, you know, imprint upon, you know, anthropological methodology still loomed large well into the Bosian era. You know, uh, if you want to think of some of the early, you know, you know, some of the early descriptions of non-Western peoples come from, you know, uh, explorers and conquerors of, you know, uh, European empires. You know, I can think of like, you know, uh, the uh, journals of Ber uh, Bernardino de Sawan, uh, the uh, Chronicle of uh, the Northern. Northern Spain provinces by Andres Perez de Rivas, uh, the French explorer of California, uh, August uh, Le Peru. Um, you can look at uh, the Cabrillo journals, the Vizcaino, this, uh, Sebastian Vizcaino's journals, uh, the uh, Cabeza de Vaca journals. Um, that's where an ethnographic type of description, you know, uh, emerges, but you know, the, 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 the chroniclers are intellectuals of their time, but, you know, maybe they went to a seminary or something like that if they were missionaries, but they didn't have any, but they didn't have a methodology, you know, in order to kind of filter and describe and to interpret uh, other than what they saw and how they understand it within whatever they knew, you know, from, 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 from being educated. And so uh, I think from, you know, the, you know, from the, uh, you know, conquering or discovery of the new world, you know, to the professionalization of the social sciences and humanities that I think the vanishing trope was the dominant one all the way through into the late 19th and early 20th century. But still, na natural history lingering on, we can think of, uh, the Bureau of American Ethnology and government scientists as being in that period is the last vestige of like you know the natural historians at that time. It's a really good question. I hadn't thought you know, piecing those things together. I'm not sure if this would work logistically. Sure. Just no. take it. Yeah, sure. um, but um, since APS already compiled all that metadata, is there any yeah. possibility that once the volumes are done that you could kind of do an interactive index? Where I know those papers wouldn't be available, but, but um, yeah. you know, you could search for various things and then maybe right. it would say this volume. I don't right. even know if that's possible, but it would be cool. Yeah, 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 yeah. that's a really good question. The, um, <clears throat> almost all scholarly publishers these days are um, 
when they publish, you know, a physical book or you know the offset edition, um, that they're also releasing simultaneously an ebook edition mm-hmm. uh, of their publications. And so, with the Boaz volumes, there is going to be an ebook version of it, um, and um, ebook sales for scholarly books uh, are mostly, uh, you know, um, I've had our tech person describe it to me, but it's in a particular format where it is, um, it's, it's, it's on a platform that's for like a library and an institutional platform, uh, and um, oftentimes it's uh, difficult to buy something like, you know, like a documentary or, or reference work we publish uh, in, you know, for like a Kindle or Nook or something like that. Um, uh, you, you can buy our scholarly books and our general interest or trade books, um, like on Amazon, you can buy the ebook uh, edition. But uh, for some of the special projects that um, have like a really heavy apparatus to them or, or, or like lots of like color illustrations and stuff like that, it's really hard for us to code them and to convert them uh, into uh, reader platforms. And so um, I think what we're gonna do is just basically the ebook is gonna be just a digital edition of the um, you know, offset edition. Uh, and the only thing is, is that for the ebook, it'll be searchable by mm-hmm. you know, keywords. But to do an interactive index, I think that's gonna kind of be on. Be, Go to be, Philly. Yeah, you know, be yeah, be, beyond the be, beyond the capabilities of uh, UNP or the editors. But I think that you know APS indicated that they were going to create something like that. They have some people in house who have that level of like technical skill, um, and so. Um, but I'm not quite sure, you know, how that's going. Well, cool, thanks. That's a good question. So I thought I'd ask two questions. Sure. One, since UNP publishes Lewis and Clark, mm-hmm. some of the most well-known imperial explorers that we have in this country, yeah. Um, what's your angle from the press as far as a return on this? And I, I'm also just kind of curious sure. about the, the Canadian grants. I know for a lot of U.S. grants, it has to be open source, or it has to be more sort of openly available. And what was the Canadian stipulations, or what was the Canadian desire for the project? There aren't uh, those kinds of stipulations. Like there is happening, like in the uh, uh, you know National Science Foundation grants here, and uh, NEH and NEA. Uh, I remember following that conver- you know, debate or conversation that was going on about that. You know, one of the you know, I mean, one of the great things about Bo just just Boaz's career in particular is that it has a Canadian context that American U.S. scholars have kind of ignored mm-hmm. in, in, in 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 certain respects. <coughs> so the so working with Regna, you know, who's Canadian and teaches at you know a Canadian university, is that one uh, we would be able to obtain a larger sum of money through SSHRC than we would through the through you know, NSF here um, or any age, um, and two, um, you know that we wouldn't be hemmed in by the kind of congressional politics that have spilled into like <laughs> you know making things you know open access and you know giving it away for free, and the scholars and the institutions never get paid like royalties for people using it and stuff like that. Um, um, you know that um, the Lewis and Clark papers. I mean, I think this is really funny. Uh, you know, I think I can talk about it. It's not proprietary knowledge, but that you know, Gary, Gary, nobody will hear outside this room. Gary <laughs> Moulton, who is a <laughs> wonderful, <laughs> yeah, Gary Moulton, who's a retired and emeritus professor at the University of Nebraska Lincoln, is just a wonderful guy, and he's, he's one of the great documentary editors of his generation, um, and that. Um, um, I guess when Gary and the former director of APS first talked about doing it, uh, what was the name of the director of APS? Wit somebody, but um, um, Martin Levitt, the librarian at APS, was telling me about 
this, but he said, Matt, well, when we bring this project under contract, let's use the contract for Lewis and Clark papers. So I looked through the files, there's no, con there's no contract. And so I think that the, 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 the president of APS at the time just said to Gary, okay, yeah, Gary, you can do it. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, 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 and I said, really, Martin? He's like, yeah, well, you know, some of the older people that have worked here for a long time just said he was that kind of guy. He said, sure, Gary, if you want to do it, just do it. And so a lot of the editing was actually done and, and kind of underwritten by uh, the Lincoln campus. Hmm. You know, I think Gary had some institutional support, you know, to hire people to transcribe the journals and, you know, other kinds of expenses. So, uh, but what happened in the end is that, you know, the American Philosophical Society you know, has not received any royalties from the Lewis and Clark papers, which I think generated about 3.5 million dollars you know for the University of Nebraska Press and so knowing that um, I um, you know when I drew up the contract I you know did what's called a profit loss statement you know for a volume has a particular you know they're gonna be about 450 pages and this is gonna be the trim size and here are the manufacturing costs and I you know did all the you know uh, you know, financials for it. And uh, so, you know, we offered them, you know, a really good royalty rate. Uh, and I made it actually better than the average documentary volume because they had never been compensated for the Lewis and Clark papers. Mm -hmm. And so they were very happy with the contract. And we, you know, they had some things that they wanted in the contract that we were able to accommodate. Um, uh, but uh, but that you know our negotiations and finalizing the project I think are I'm not saying it was unprofessional but that it's it's on a more professional legal level mm -hmm. and to really make all the partners you know receive the compensation for the work and, and investment in the project that they're doing so that was really important to me uh, there was a little bit of you know discussion about it internally at you what I had prescribed you know, would be fair. Mm -hmm. so. And I mean, they had the initial investment in digitizing as well, so. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so I was very happy, and they were very happy, you know, that we had revisited the previous project that we had done with them, and we noticed that, you know, it was just kind of done on a handshake, really, you know, or done verbally. Um, and, and, and so, you know, and, I mean, APS has a, a nice, sizable endowment as an institution, but, um, you know, when they're able to receive, you know, royalties and compensation for the uh, projects they allow publishers and scholars to do out of their collections, you know, they're going to put the money to good use. You know, they have many fellowship and grant programs to bring researchers, and particularly junior researchers, into their, you know, research library. Um, and... Uh, um, so that the money will not, you know, the money will be well utilized, and so in that regard, you know, um, the project will help, you know, um, an additional stream of revenue come into their institution, and in turn benefit scholars, you know, that need to use their collections. That was a good question. Any other questions? Well. Thank you very much. Sure, yeah. <laughs> um, Absolutely. So, yeah. I don't know, Sylvanus or the, the guy in Latin America? Yeah, Sylvanus Moore. So, yeah. um, was Boaz, was there a lot of government interference or was there, he just didn't like that there was money being exchanged or was there um, like some things that were only reported to the government but not made it into his papers or was there an agenda there? I'm not asking this right now. Oh, well. yeah. Um, well, the... Um, the the Morley case is really interesting because um, I, I, I think that Boaz b believed that um, that scholars and intellectuals are, were were kind of uh, free floating entities that you know shouldn't you know um, from the standpoint of objectivity, but but I think more important independence, uh, not to be tied to you know uh, particular institutions or interests or so even wouldn't there be nation like states that that they that they um, um, that they be unaligned in some ways. So 
So did he have like any trouble reconciling that later when he worked for uh, the census? I thought you said that he did um, the head count, that he got that through. He did. I, I mean, you know, he was, you know, basically on contract, you know, to do that study. But, um, yeah, that's an interesting question because, you know, Boaz, um, you know, was basically seeking, you know, uh, you know a that's the best way to get the data. like a government subcontract to fund research that he already wanted to do. Um, for example, like a, reading through his personal correspondence <coughs> with, with uh, Alex Herlishka led to reading the correspondence between Herlishka and Boaz with Charles Davenport, you know, and, you know, you know, given the funding climate, you know, for social science research at this time, you know, that you see, you know, that you see, uh, you know, in this correspondence, you know, Boaz, you know, asking Charles Davenport, um, if he might be able to use some of the Car Carnegie Foundation money that Davenport got, so that Boaz could do some work on racial amalgamation or basically racial intermarriage. Um, and so, you know, Boaz and Davenport, you know, uh, you know Boaz loathed you know, amateur scientists like Davenport and Stoddard and others, um, but. Uh, he also at times asked him for money. You know, can I ride on your Carnegie, you know, foundation money? <coughs> and it's just because, <coughs> you know, the funding climate was you know so minimal uh, at that time that um, you know all all scientists and social scientists were looking to different private foundations and private entities to fund their research. Um, so you know, morally, you know perhaps doesn't look, you know, quite as bad, uh, but that, um, you know, I think there's a difference between, you know, asking for resources, maybe from somebody that you don't agree with, and then, you know, actually spying, you know, for your government under the cover of doing, like, objective field research. You know, that's how most people, you know, in the discipline see that incident, and there are those, you know, I mean, there's a Book published by University of New Mexico Press, which is a defense of Sylvanus Morley. It's called "The Scientist Was a Spy," you know, by two actually Mexicanist uh, or uh, you know modern Mexican historians. Um, you know, the book has a lot of problems, uh, in my own opinion, but um, they're defenders of Morley out there. Um, I know historians who work in Latin American history. You know, some of which I've you know, been in departments with who, who work for the State Department. They, they're gathering intelligence and it helps pay for the research trips. <laughs> you know, no one can stop them from doing it. Is it objective, is it not? You know, I don't know, you know. Um, it's for the individual scholar, intellectual to decide for themselves, you know, where they want to seek their resources. So, you know. I, I'm not judgmental of my colleagues, but you know they told me that they did it. You know that that's what they do, and that's where they get, you know, their their summer research travel money. So that's just a matter of a, you know, individual conscience. Mm -hmm. point. Christine, any other questions? No, I'm sure. <laughs> All right, great. <thanks. laughs> Well, thank you, Matt. All right, thank you. Good luck on your project. All right. Thank you.